Well, welcome to the Brainstorming the Human Connection, with, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. My name is Lawrence Diggs. And did you know that April is Poetry Month? It is, and we're going to be talking about poetry today with uh, two people who really know something about poetry. They're the past and present presidents of the South Dakota uh, poetry, State Poetry Society, SDSPS. And uh, they have been involved with poetry in this state for quite a while. And uh, they, of course, are on the board of the South Dakota State Poetry Society. That's how they become presidents of it. And we're going to be talking about poetry, and we're going to be talking about uh, how poetry uh, is useful to South Dakota, to your lives, to all of our lives, uh, and giving you some kind of background as to uh, what the Poetry Society has been doing and is doing and plans to do in the future, and how you can also become involved in it. So Bruce and Dana, welcome. Dana Yost and Bruce Roseland. So, uh, well, first of all, let's let's get a little background on you guys because I, I know both of you, but the the uh, our esteemed panel here probably doesn't, so we can give them some kind of background. Let's start with Bruce. Uh, Bruce, I don't know if there are actually words in the English language, you know, to describe you, but how would you describe how would you describe yourself? <laughs> Uh, where, where, where are you from? Give us a little background, the, the elevator, the Bruce Roseland elevator speech. Uh, I rarely ever give an elevator speech. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 actually, I'm going to take it back to high school. Okay. Uh, I, I was in high school and mm. probably in my junior, senior year. And uh, in, back in those days, you're a one of a certain kind. You know, you had the jocks, you know, and I was fairly good in athletes. And then you had what we called the eggheads, which was uh, rarely more than three or four people in one of our classes. I, had, I was in a class of about 76 kids. And uh, then you had the others who just kind of, you know, had a, Lord knows, we didn't pay much attention. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and the deal of it is I really liked literature really really liked it i was really good at you know um uh, sports but it it just hit me i did not want to be either one or the other that was your identity you know and uh it just hit me you can be more than one kind of person in your life so that has been my um my efforts throughout my life is okay. uh those things that interest me that i like doing mm -hmm. go do them Go do and get good at them if you can. So uh, I'm the fourth generation rancher. I was the only son of a farmer rancher. I came back, but I came back in the 80s, uh, 1980 to be exact, just in time for the farm crisis where a lot of people <laughs> left the farm. And that definitely shaped my thinking because I had to sit back and wonder why do so many people of my generation were trying so hard to stay on the land? You know, and uh, probably uh, oh, at that time, three out of five of my friends left, wow. which is quite a shell out. Yep. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is uh, I had these thoughts about it, you know, and that's what got me started writing. So around 2000, I started actually sitting down and writing my thoughts down. And it turned out uh, I can't write prose. I write uh, free verse poetry because if I write a, a page of prose, I end up just tearing words out and getting down to the essence. It's mm. it's uh, mm. it's just something that that I do, and and in doing, and then I end up with about uh, a fifteen at the most twenty, rarely longer, uh, lined poem, mm -hmm. and it's a story. So I got looking around and I, I wrote a book and I got it, 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 it got a national award that was very lucky. 
totally accidental. So I'm an ac I consider myself an accidental uh, poet writer because mm -hmm. it it just kind of I fell into it. And well, I will I will say that I've read your poetry and it's something more than an accident. I, I will say that. <laughs> it's all accidental. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I, I I don't uh, three quarters. 80% of my poems uh, that I write happen mm. in the first writing. And then after that is shaping, which is so important. Oh, yeah. And if I was going to give advice to people is write what's in your heart and then go ahead and then see whether or not it is relating to other people. That's when you add and take out. If it, if it relates to other people, that they themselves find value in it well then that's what you keep in and what does not you take it out it's okay said. we're going to get we're going to get into that a little bit more but i want to go to dana now and dana can you give us some <laughs> kind of idea of of who you are well um i grew up in southwest minnesota and I went to Southwest Minnesota State University, uh, was a creative writing literature major, and just fortunate there, they had this pool of exceptional, I mean, nationally known writers who were, were professors there. And they were all, several of them were influences on me. And then I, I worked for 29 years in, as a daily newspaper writer or editor, mostly in Minnesota, a little bit at the Argus Leader in Sioux Falls. Um, and uh, won some state and national awards doing that. Uh, and I left that, left the industry in 2008. And since then I've written eight books with a ninth book on the way, some history books, uh, a couple poetry books. Um, one, of the, one of the history books came out in 2017 and it's 700 pages long. It's about life in the rural Midwest and in and about the year 1940, a little bit going, um, into the depression and a little bit going forward into world war ii and i thought i'll never write another book that big again it took me three years and lots of research and all kinds of reading and so, so I, i'm really concentrating on poetry now you know much like bruce said, it's a much more condensed uh, form of writing and, and uh, um, it, it has it, it strikes me a little bit like journalism in that you're you're trying to uh convey something very quickly to readers you know um and, and I, but I, I write more where Bruce tells stories a lot. I write more impressionistic poetry, um, you know, images and um, quick drawings of characters and stuff like that. So, um, but I try to convey truths through that. Just you know, I think po poetry does that in, in in whatever form you're trying to do. You know, mm -hmm. so um, I, and I lived mostly in Minnesota, and then about seven years in Forest City, Iowa. And then I've lived the last four years in Sioux Falls. So my, okay. my wife works for a TV station here. Oh, okay. Thanks. Let's get into uh, a little bit about poetry. I'm wondering if you guys can give us your particular definition of poetry. Because I think all conversations kind of start with, you know, agreement of terms. But in this case, I'm looking for your personal perspective when you know when you, when you think of poetry what is it what defines it well and I wrote something along those lines for the new the coming out issue of past petals our semi-annual uh, um, anthology but it to me poetry is the most essential or fundamental form of language you know there's prose there's journalism, there's history writing, there's whatever kind of writing, but poetry is the most primary form of writing because it conveys what's in the, conveys your emotions, what's in your heart, it conveys experience in a very compact, precise form where each word matters. And in each word, you're telling somebody else what's in, in your heart, you know, and um, whether it's joy or anger or depression or whatever it may be, you are conveying that and, and you're trying to re get readers to relate to that, to, to almost feel the same thing you're feeling. So I, I think it's, the like I said, the most fundamental form of writing. It's like music in a way, it's universal, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, Bruce, what, what would you say? How would you define poetry? Well, it's uh, obviously it's, it's written, though uh, it ends up being spoken, should be. Mm -hmm. uh, what poetry does in the most direct manner is to convey to another person or a group of people what it is that you value and why they should value that too. And um, I like telling a story because that's, that's what I see that happens in my daily life. And then uh, it's the connection. It's how we connect. And uh, I, I think a lot more people are, have poetry in their heart and a lot of times they don't recognize it. I didn't recognize it. I had these little stories pop in my head. And when I started writing them down, people said, well, that, that's poetry. Uh, and that's what we try to do is to encourage other people to realize, you know, this is what it is and why it has value and why it should be spoken to another person because a poem not heard, your values not heard to the rest of the world is like, um, yeah, that tree falling in the forest. Does anyone hear it? <laughs> yeah. Great. So I want to encourage the uh, the uh, our esteemed panel here, all of all of our, our the folks who are on this Zoom call, to think yourself about what poetry is to you. What's your experience with poetry? And in, in a few minutes, I'm going to give you time to think about it. But in a few minutes, I, I want to to uh, have you share what it is you think poetry is. Um, why is poetry important to South Dakota? Either Bruce, Dana, why what's why is it important to South Dakota? Go ahead, Dana. I'm curious. No, okay. Well, <laughs> I think partly. Um, there are so many different types of uh, cultures and lifestyles in South Dakota. Is a range, you know, of uh, it's a very diverse state. So I think poetry is a good way for those different cultures, those different groups, to express themselves in ways that the rest of the state can understand. You know, and I, I, there's a lot of stories to be told, and I think those stories need to be heard. Um, and, and poetry is a very good way to do that. Um, but I, I think you look at the it, it, indigenous population, you, you know, I want to learn more about them. Um, you look at where I live in Sioux Falls, the biggest city, I think there's things that we can tell the rural population. And I want to learn, as a newer person to South Dakota, I want to learn more about rural South Dakota. And I, so I think people who write poetry like, like Bruce does about life on the ranch, life on the farm, um, I can soak up those experiences. And Bruce also wrote a book that I read about the dying of his mother. And so it, even on a very personal level, it was about grief and about the processing of um, her dying that had universal truths in it that I learned from. And so I think just the, the telling of those stories is always important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a way that people could tell their story. It's a, it's a form in which people can tell their stories. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Bruce, how about you? Uh, Why is well, it important to South Dakota? I mean, in general, it's a, I think it's important to everyone, but in particular, what, what kind of things can South Dakotans get from uh, reading, writing, experiencing poetry? Oh. Uh, it's way of recording uh, our time in our place. Um, you know, just like, oh, you can go national. Uh, grapes of wrath, you know. Uh, giants in the earth, that greatly inspired me. So uh, those, those are pros. And in poetry, we try to convey, you know, what it is like to live in this time, in this place. It's our little uh, uh, little missile that we're sending out to the future so that people can know what it was like. 
you know, whether or not it's in your personal life. And I, I, I say that to people, you know, uh, perhaps you don't think anybody's interested, you know, in uh, your life. But I assure you, your great grandchildren, your grandchildren, and probably your children, you know, would like to know what it was like to live in this time and place. And that's what got me writing was my great grandfather who first settled this area. He left no written record of it. Uh, and, you know, just a few stories passed on. And I got to thinking, my goodness, he was one of the first settlers out here. I would have loved to know a day in his life. Tell me the what. Tell me the why. Tell me about a day in your life. So that is why we should write. We should record however we need to do so. Mm -hmm. Great. Now I want to switch to uh, getting people to actually do that. You know, what are some ways that people can um, come in contact with poetry see what it can do and start to understand the different forms in which they can experience poetry. How, how, how can people come to experience poetry? Uh, to me, one of the, the best ways is to go to a poetry reading where, like, like Bruce said, where it's spoken out loud um, and, and, and go to one where there's maybe multiple poets, uh, and, and you'll find them at your libraries, at um, you know, bookstores, um, theaters, other places like that. You know, in Sioux Falls, there's a, a book co-op that has regular readings and open mics where you can go read your own poetry. Um, but that's one of the, the first ways you get a feel for what the, the language is like. Um, and then I think, you know, there are writers groups and some have veteran writers in them. Some welcome younger or, or newer first time poets. There's a community um, services uh, poetry group for senior citizens in Sioux Falls and they're beginners, but they write, it's like writing their memories. Like Bruce said, what if his great grandfather had written down what it was like? These people are writing uh, and then they're reading to each other. And so they're getting a feel for it, you know? Bruce, what, what would you say? Uh, I agree with Dana. You should go to uh, readings. I learned a lot, my goodness, uh, sitting and listening to other people read. Uh, but I think one of the biggest things is that uh, a person, you know, uh, oh my goodness, the first time I ever read in front of a group, I had terrible stage fright. And I had that for a long time. Uh, you got to get... Uh, Failure is fine. There's no real thing called failure. And people are very welcoming. And if you get up there and your hands shaking a little bit and your voice is quavering, well, welcome to the crowd. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I've got to the point where it, you know, I prepare and, you know, go with it. Uh, mm -hmm. Some, and, But the deal of it is you never know how you're writing is until you speak it out loud and then you know how the audience react that it gives you some guidance as your direction because if if uh the people are not receiving what you're saying well then you should probably craft it a little bit different uh and that that that's where i have learned you know in in these public readings and then listening to other people read i learn how to read better you know, that, that, that I got to just tell you, one of the best places to go is uh, the Festival of the Books. Mm -hmm. Hear other people read. We, uh, uh, our, our society has an open mic. You're welcome to it. Come to that one, you know. Uh, we have open, open meetings, too. <laughs> and open meetings, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's all these things combined. You'll find, what I have found is that uh, people are not judgmental. They're there to encourage you. Uh, and you find yourself, you're, you're in a like group, you know? Right. And I would say most of the people won't heckle you. Uh, well, only you, Lawrence. Only you. <laughs> you know, uh, 
several of my other friends. I think. <laughs> well, okay, so uh, I'm going to turn now to our, our uh, uh, other guest and panelist and uh, on this call and ask you about what does how do you define poetry and 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 or what does it mean to you what does poetry mean to you and or how would you did define it dun, 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 dun. Well, there, there's some really good very good writers on the, on this panel here or on this I, group. I, see, I see that I see that yeah, but yeah, want, but, yeah, but maybe they they want to keep their, their their secrets of how they write good poetry <laughs> they want to keep it a secret so they don't, they don't want to tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> No, they're going to win poetry contests if they don't share what the yeah. poetry secrets. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep thinking about that, and uh, we'll we'll come back to it. Uh, we've been talking and mentioning the South Dakota State Poetry Society, uh, Bruce and Dana. Can you talk about what is the uh, Poetry Society. Well, I'll, I'll say one thing and I'll turn it over to Bruce because he's been involved a lot, a lot more, but our, the first line of the mission statement is that we are exist to promote the writing and publication of poetry. Um, so we do whatever it takes to get writers published, including publishing our own books, but, uh, you know, and, uh, and encourage many, many people to just write. You know, but I'll let Bruce say more. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, uh, Poetry Society now, uh, which is one of the longest running uh, poetry societies in America, uh, continuously. Uh, and uh, for many, many, many years, uh, 14, 15 years, uh, the the thing, well, I, now I was president for a number of years, but uh, my, I can just tell you my personal philosophy, which was uh, we would do whatever it is as long as we have money and somebody to run it. We're a volunteer organization, we have a board of directors. Uh, our bylaws takes that up to 15 board of directors members, not counting poet laureates, which are for life. And basically each one of them got a job to do. So, you know, we have the chapbook poetry contest. And of course we have the editors for our poetry magazine, Past Cuddles. Uh, and we promote a number of things. Uh, we're involved with the, uh, the festival of books. Uh, so, you know, uh, we got ongoing programs. Like I said, it's volunteer. So this is something you can jump into, but I have to say this is that uh, it has been in, and still is and will continue to be, I well, continue to be, I don't know if there'd be any other group that would try to jump up and do it. We are statewide. We have a presence statewide. Uh, our members are across the state. Our board of directors are recruited across the state uh, and, and, uh, I, I think that gives us a, a bigger, a wider pool of talent and, and interest uh, and an ability to project, uh, to go to practically any corner of the state and have something happen. So I think that's all good. Um, so that is what the society by itself has, has been uh, uh, an effort to do. Uh, when I first started out as a writer and going out and speaking, the thing I ran into was that there were very few uh, venues, very few places to actually speak. And that I think is a, is a cry in need is for uh, opportunities for one thing to get published, which is what we try to do in, in various ways. And the other is to be heard out loud, to have places to go to, and even more important, to be interconnected, to meet face to face. Uh, you know, have a name on a page is one thing, but to meet that person and then talk with them, you always find the commonalities and the inspirations. Many different walks of life, 
uh, and many different experiences. So yes, we try to weave together this identity, which is South Dakota, which, like I said, we are writing off our, of our time and place and recording it for besides now for the future. And I, I believe that that is so important for the future to be able to look back and see how it is. Like I said, giants in the earth, you read that. Now you know how those Norwegian uh, settlers, like I said, I wish that my great grandfather had written a little bit. Well, right there, we know how it is. Another, uh, it, it's more than just one way of doing things. Um, you know, I, uh, I ran into so many people who have been inspired by Harvey Dunn. And he did that. And it was his, uh, you know, message to the future. This is where we come from. This is who we are. These, this is how South Dakota got settled. And I don't care what walk of life you're in. You know, uh, Dana has been talking about the native population. You know, this is how we record this forward. This is uh, one of the ways uh, you can do it for music. You can do it for prose. My goodness, there's so many different ways of doing it. But we as an organization, because we have this common interest and ability, this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think those are really, really good points. Were you going to say something, Dana? Uh, somebody asked how to, how to get in contact with us, and the best way is through sdpoetry.org. And, there's and that's in the chat. Me. It's in the chat, by the way, so you can click on that. And, and don't forget, in the chat, folks, down at the bottom, uh, there's three little dots. If you click on that, you can save the chat to your desktop or, or someplace, wherever you your saves go to in, on your computer. So you can, you can have any uh, links that uh, come up and Carol is very good about putting those links in the, in the chat. So anything that comes up, uh, you can grab that. Um, you know, something that you guys have been talking about uh, is having, using poetry to, to leave the breadcrumbs back to uh, the times before. And I think that, that can't be overemphasized. There's so much. Uh, there's so much that happens in our lives of ordinary people. Ordinary meaning that the people who actually do the day-to-day -day grinding and making the society work, the the insights that they have, the lifestyles and points of view that they have, and they get lost because they are not writing. In long ago times, like you know, a couple hundred years ago and before, most people could not read and write in any country. Most people could not. It was given to those people who had leisure time and discretionary income. Those were the only people who wrote anything. And so only their stories were told. Yeah. This is different. Yeah. Everybody yeah. now can tell their stories. Writing and you're reading and writing however your form is, provides a way to tell the story of the people who actually make the thing work. You know, it's not like some 10 or 15 people who mostly overemphasize their, their importance. It's the people who do the day-to-day -day things and having those people's insight. At some point, those people, their stories will be very interesting. A lot of those people we read about, quite frankly, they're boring. You know, because most of it is kind of it seems to be kind of made up, you know, and and self aggrandizement. But when you come to the stories that really affect our lives, because we live every day and we're struggling with some of the same things, letting other people know what your struggle is, even if you don't have an answer, that's useful stuff. It's useful stuff to your kids, their kids, and and their kids and your kids' friends. You know, so I can't, uh, you know, emphasize more that, you know, that the importance of what Dana and and uh, Bruce have been saying about uh, the importance of writing and poetry gives you a concise way that you can like pick out that nugget, that twinkle in the snowflake of life that you can just call attention to that 
And you don't have to write a whole book about that twinkle in the snowflake because mm -hmm. that little thing you say is just enough, you know? So anybody else have any ideas or anything they want to contribute? All you have to do is like unmute yourself and start talking or do one of those hand raises. Todd? Yeah. So something that Bruce has said before, and I always find this pretty interesting, and I want to know from uh, like y'all's experience, you had once, or you've said more than once that there are a lot of poets out there, but they're not necessarily like outed poets. Like there's a lot of people writing that may not feel like they're confident enough or that they're writing it mostly for themselves or they haven't worked through how to write it or whatever. How do, I guess, how do y'all um, encourage them to kind of take that next step and, and share it? Because I think one of the key things, I mean, when we've been talking about, you know, communication of poetry, one of the key parts of it is just that. It's the sharing part. Yeah. You know, it, it's not like Kafka in a cave writing, you know, <laughs> endless m mounds of paper and then 10% of it getting to the people. The sharing part is the essence of it. I mean, and, and we've talked about that before in our poetry groups about how, you know, what I write might mean something completely different to you, oh, yeah. but it's still essentially important because that right, whatever you write or whatever you speak ends up being that shared space. This is where we get our shared meaning. And, and so how do you get people to kind of, I guess, join in, join the party? Well, I, I think just make them feel safe or comfortable in sharing stuff first and say, you know, you, if you have a writer's group, everybody's in, like Bruce had said, everybody's in the same boat. You know, uh, we're all in that same space sharing what we're writing and, and we want, I think we want feedback. We want to, we want to hear what's good in our poetry, what's not good, whether you're a beginning poet or a veteran poet, I think you want, you know, you want to do that. So I, I think the the first steps are finding a writer's group, uh, whether in person or online. You know, there's hundreds of online writing groups. Some of them, some of them are good. Some of them are really nasty, and you want to stay away from those where they give you <laughs> just horrible feedback. You know, I mean, your poem just sucks. You know, and, uh, you, you, so stay away, stay away from that stuff. But uh, you know, but there are others. You know, you can find like through libraries or through you know, Sioux Falls the community services. Um, even our one of the churches I know about has a beginners writing beginners poetry group. Um, so I think if you feel you have something of value, something to say, even if you have just an inkling that it's in you, bring it forward to a writer's group is the first thing and then see what other people have to say about it, you know, and just get over that first qualm of, of being, being afraid of reading it. You know, I, I've written, I don't know, hundreds of poems and I still am afraid of reading a poem to somebody, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I go to this, the book co-op sometimes and read and there are people, you know, I'm 61 and there are people like 22, 23, and I, how am I going to connect to them? You know, they, they write this flashy, just boom, boom, poems. And here I am writing my stuff and it's like, oh, okay. But, you know, but you have to get over that hurdle and be, I think, again, realize that many other people are in the same position you are in, a little bit afraid, a little bit tentative about reading or writing their poem, sharing their poetry. So go out and share it and then see what happens, you know? And, yeah. You know, I think, uh, go ahead, Bruce. Um, somebody, when I first started writing, uh, gave me really good advice, you know, which was, uh, you'll get better. You'll get better yeah. if you keep uh, working at it. If you keep writing, you'll get better. And it's actually the best piece of advice I ever got. Uh, the other thing is uh, you have to decide on your style. And uh, the best way I'm going to explain that, and this is a hard thing to, to come to to understand, is you've got to find your voice. Uh, you know, we start out, you know, being told our voice, which is called our education system. Yeah. And uh, so we think this is the way it should be. At a certain point, um, you know, this idea about a true word is actually makes some sense. And that is, is, you know, 
uh, are you writing what you really, really think? Is it from you? It is not being shaped by outside influences, whether you want to call it to society or your past English teacher or whatever. Uh, you know, in other words, you, you are writing from the heart. When you look at something, even if it's really mundane, if you describe that and how you your relationship to it and how it should uh, how you feel that it should be related to the rest of the world then you're starting to find your true voice the other thing of it is is uh all good writing comes from emotion which is just no. from the heart in other words if you have experienced it if you have seen it the words you pick will be true they will be the right words. Now, saying all this, you have to be open to uh, a critique. Criticism maybe is a bad word, but critique. In other words, if you're saying something, if it falls flat, people don't understand what, you, what you're saying, or you're using words that don't relate to them, then you have to be uh, well-versed enough go inside your your head or whatever i i i thumb i got a this is my webster dictionary see how well thumb it is <laughs> and um i i go I'm so glad it's not a thesaurus you should see the condition his thumb is in <laughs> <laughs> I, I should add a, if I can add a couple things what what Bruce is saying reminds me a little bit of what Hemingway one of Hemingway's mantras one true sentence you know followed by another true sentence uh, and, and those all a lot of that comes from experience or comes from what you you know observation or whatever you know but that's one way to start finding your voices to write one true sentence and and then on on sharing your work with others it doesn't it doesn't i should amend this it doesn't always have to be in a, in a group you you find somebody else just one person or two people to share your poems with that you trust that you know that you'll get good feedback from um that i think is another good way and i i still do that i have a couple of readers that read my poems before i, I do much more with them you know just just two people um and you know, that's another very good way of getting feedback but it, but again, you still have to put your your work out there, you know, and uh, and, and and trust it's going to get going to be in safe I hands. Totally, I totally agree with Dana about that. Uh, you you need some uh, folks that, that you trust. Just just because somebody says they're an editor doesn't mean that they're an editor for you. They got to yeah. know where you're coming from and where you're trying to go to, and it could be a couple good friends who are honest uh it, it could be a writer's group that you you get along with uh i i've been in uh, i've been in workshops and generally speaking i i don't do very well in workshops but i've been in some writers groups that have been just tremendous because they say what is this line or maybe you just ain't the right word because it, it it's like not what it's really telling us what you're trying to say so yeah you got those feedbacks so that 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 really helps, you know. Uh, I I don't know the 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 nice part about the human language, the English language, is that we all speak it. You know, I see we have a uh, at least one uh, artist on board here, Mark, and uh, you know I couldn't possibly tell him anything about his painting, but he could probably tell me something about my writing because we share something. I don't understand painting, but mm -hmm. he understands the uh, English language. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that that's what we have in common is it, it, this commonality, and then we the background. I wouldn't tell try to tell somebody who who is from the reservation how they should express themselves because I don't know their background. Now, if there was another farmer or environmentalist, I I I, I may have something to say about that. So, you know, there, there's some things I, I could say and other things, boy, I, 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 the best thing I can do is listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, Mar Marge, did you have something you were gonna say? Well, I, I like uh, poetry, uh, you know, when they 
they try to come up with a word that rhymes with the line or two before it. And they often come up with a word that I would have never thought about. And it just gives a deeper meaning to the whole poem. It, it, uh, it's, it's, I, I'm not a writer, I'm not a poet, but uh, I like reading things that rhyme and, and uh, it often gives a dip, deeper meaning when they get a word that just really uh, rhymes with what they wrote before. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, speaking of that, Marge, um, we can be writers, but we can also be um, performers and we can also be facilitators of poetry. For example, maybe you don't write and maybe you're just interested in poetry or maybe you're interested in entertainment, but you can invite some poets to your living room, fix a dinner or something like that and invite some friends and now you got a party. And if you have five or 10 people who show up at your, at your uh, you know, tea and crumpets and poetry, then I think, you know, that's sometimes as many as pe many people that show up at a, uh, a poetry slam, you know, oh, yeah. that, that is often, you already got a quorum. And so just because you don't have a stadium, you know, like a football stadium full of people doesn't mean that it isn't a thing. Poetry can be very intimate. And so, you know, there's, there are opportunities for everyone. Bruce, you were gonna say something? Yeah, uh, I've been around this long enough. Uh, one of the first uh, Poetry Society annual meetings I went to was at a home, which was actually not too far away from here. And uh, these were the older members. I mean, a lot of them were definitely over 70, over 80. And anyway, we sat around the living room of this uh, house and there was probably old 15, 20 people and they each read round robin going around. And that was so neat uh, that, that it kind of hooked me on the whole thing because it was informal. And, uh, and I was surprised at the quality. These, this was the board of directors. Uh, this was probably like uh, 2009, 2008. And a lot of, for a lot of those folks' meetings, uh, that, that meeting was their last meeting. They just simply have aged out. So it was one last great hurrah. So I, I saw that older generation of the board of directors, and they were really neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sharon had a question before, I think, or she had her hand up. Go ahead. But you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, how's that? Yeah. Uh, I had the question, it was really a comment in the chat to Bruce because he was talking about the past and the future. But I, so that's why I put my hand up then. But I also, since Hemingway's name has been, has crept into this conversation, <laughs> he said, well, when you're writing, you have to have a built-in S-H-I-T uh, detector yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. and you might not see it right away but you might get to see it and not from people laughing at you but just knowing your work well enough having read enough poetry so that you can see what could be stronger in, in your own work so, that that you... was the question was oh. it okay all right, this is totally non-relevant, but where do you get your background, your 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 backdrops, your ignorance? Oh, me, I, I made some green, them. Green, shiny, kind of curtain-like, <laughs> and then it became a kind of a river, and then it became this, ah, kaleidoscopic <laughs> mountain. Oh, yeah, I... I make them myself. Oh my goodness. All right, back to poetry. <laughs> <laughs> After a short commercial break. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Dana for letting me come in. <laughs> Good, well, that was, that was uh, appreciated uh, Sharon. I, I want to open it up again though to anyone else have uh, comments. Uh, Carolyn, did you open your mic to say something? Price? 
she she's a friend of mine. She 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 often tells me she does not get poetry. She does not understand it. <laughs> she doesn't understand poetry. Well, this is this is your chance, Carolyn. You know? This is your ticket out. What, what is ticket. hard to understand about poetry, unless you're reading it about uh, nuclear physics, and it's really a good poem for people who know nuclear physics, but it's incomprehensible for people who don't know nuclear physics. And this is a little bit what Bruce was talking about too. But even that subject can be made comprehensible. I just don't get this incomprehensible business. Yeah. No. Maybe no. Bobby, did you have did you have something you wanted to say? Maybe you could answer Sharon's question. Yeah. Hi, this is Bobby. There are two of us in the room, and honestly, I don't have an answer to her question other than I think that a lot of times perspective is really important, and that's really what I love about poetry in general is it gives us perspective into another's viewpoint without having to agree or disagree. So that would be my answer to that, but I'm going to turn it over to Mary, who has a question for y'all. Hi, um, I have a couple of things that I've that I've, talk, um, I've latched onto from this is that there seems to be an agreement that poetry is meant to be read aloud. And um, do when you edit, as if you ever act as an editor or a poet, do you automatically read the poems out loud to see if you like them, or do you can you tell if you just read them? That's my question. Thank you. Oh. Go ahead, Bruce. I would like to answer that. I, I can just tell you my process. Uh, like I said, I'm an accidental poet, so something pops into my head. I write it down, rough draft. Uh, generally speaking, I, I leave it alone, and then obsessively, I will come back to it and then rewrite it. Uh, then I do that longhand. Then it gets typed up after the first rewrite or two, it gets typed up and then on the page, on the printed page, it, it, it looks different. So I rewrite that to make it look better. And I realize what I'm missing and everything. That's the big thing is after a day or two or a week or a couple months, uh, I realize what's missing or maybe what shouldn't be in there. Okay, that's one process. So then I think it's finished until I read it out loud. And some of the stuff, which I think is really great lines, falls flat. And I go, wait a minute. If I'm gonna read this out loud someplace, I don't want people to eyes glaze over, you know? So I rewrite it again frequently or realize, well, maybe I should just put it aside. So the poems I write, I want them to look good on the page and also sound good when I read them. So that, yeah, so don't put people asleep and uh, it, it, it engages their interest. So it's a process. Uh, so, you know, it's like the but, finishing but, thing. So, but yeah. but did, do you, she was asking, I think, and Bobby, collect, correct me if I'm wrong. She was asking if you're, in, if you're editing it, do you read it out loud to say, well, how does this sound? I see it on the paper. But not, how not, not until the final sound. process, not to the final process. After, in after the editing, after. in the editing of other people's poems. Yeah. The editing of other people's poems? Yeah. Other oh, people's wow. Poems. Uh, how I would read their poems is not how they read them. And, mm -hmm. and that's why going to readings is so important. And because you 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 hear a poem. Uh, it, in a lot of times, how they because it's coming from the heart, it's coming from them, and how they emphasize certain words, how they you know do, they're doing this and that, and boy, it it a lot of times it makes it an entirely different poem. So uh, yes, uh, well I guess I should say no. I I don't <laughs> I do not rarely read them aloud. There are some uh, traditional poems that I have read over the years. I love reading them because man, they're snazzy. Right. You know, uh, but, they, they got, uh, uh, one of my favorites that got me hooked into poetry was back in uh, at the end of my high school years. I Don't ask me how I came upon it, but it was how. 
Howl by Allen Ginsberg. Mm. It is hypnotic. Oh. It is, uh, I, had, I, I did not understand a word it said, but I knew it had to say something. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think Bruce that this gets oh, kind of. Back, I, I think it kind of gets to Sharon's uh, point uh, before, you know, uh, about people not getting uh, poetry, and some people say I think someone else I, I forget was saying too that well I don't I don't really get poetry. Are there people who say they don't get poetry? And I think a lot of it is that they that they are reading the poems and then English has, well, language in general, it has this thing that it, you know, reading is an unnatural act. The, the brain wasn't designed to read. We have to learn to read. Speaking on the other hand, we just kind of get that because we're programmed and we're biologically set up to, to, to learn languages. And most people do, or they don't reproduce, you know, so we've been kind of cult uh, to, you know, so, so when you read something, you don't hear the inflection of how can you hear the inflection that the writer intended, right? So the, depending on the inflection, pausing, intonation, and all those things that come into play when you're reading it, if that's absent, there may, the meaning may be lost. There may not be any meaning. That said, there are a lot of people who write poems that, that quite frankly, seem to be word salad. You know, it's like throw a whole bunch of words yeah. together. And, and it may mean something to them because it's shorthand for some experience they and maybe some of their tight group of friends have had. And everybody in their group understands that because they have had a mutual experience and those words put together in that order have meaning but to everybody else, it's code, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand a poem, that's one thing. Another thing is people do try to make things rhyme. And, and in the process of making it rhyme, they lose the meaning of what they originally had to say, but it sounds beautiful. And so they call it poetry because it rhymes at the end and it has pentameter. So there, you know, if just because you don't understand the first 5,000 poems you read, the next 5,000 is going to be good. <laughs> I think we lost. Let, let me comment on Dana's uh, remark. I was driving, so I, I couldn't comment at the time that I don't get poetry. And I've read a lot of his poetry, and I don't understand it. I just want the written word. Uh, sure. So I'm still going to maintain that some of us, our brains just don't work to get to understand poetry. Well, it depends also on, on, on what you're calling poetry, because if you understand the English language, I'm pretty sure that there are some poems that you're going to get, because especially I, when people start to write prose, uh, you, you, I think you'll, you'll get it. Bruce, you are going to say something? Yeah, I, I try to throw a wide a net as possible, and I try to use the words, you know, uh, that I think are, are, are relatable to the audience. You got to know who your audience is. Mm -hmm. You know, if your audience is only uh, seven, uh, seven, eight people, uh, you know, and uh, they all share the same language and background, well, that that's your audience. But if you're trying to go to a broader audience, you know, you use the words they use. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Twain talked a lot about that because he was yep. criticized for using various words, and he said. The words I use are understood the audience mm -hmm. that I want to hear of, which is not the man living in the manor, but the stable boy. Yeah. You know, yeah. He said that. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's always, you know, kind of hit me is that know your audience, use the words and the metaphors or whatever you're trying to do. If you throw something in there that is foreign, it's going to jar them. All you have to have one word in there that they don't understand or a metaphor that is in outer space, you know, you're going to lose that audience. So you know, <laughs> there goes the whole poem, the whole yeah. story. When I was a newspaper editor, I used to have something for my staff that I called the grandmother rule. If my grandmother didn't understand a word you used or didn't understand the sentences you were saying, were writing, you were going to lose people, you know, and, and we, in a newspaper, you try to reach the broadest audience possible 
And so I think this, Bruce's point is exactly right. You, you want to be, uh, you want to be, you want your language to be understood. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so simple, plain spoken sentences, plain spoken words, there's nothing wrong with that. The, it still can convey incredibly deep human emotions, you know, in, right. in, in very understandable language, you know. Yeah. Thanks, Dana. Uh, we have a couple questions in the chat. I'd like to not leave those people hanging out there. Uh, Liz uh, says, is there a local group or class where I can start learning verbal storytelling? I need to learn cadence and pauses and uh, adding emotion to my narration. Well, depending on where you live, but like like in Sioux Falls, there are some groups, mainly high school groups, but you could probably get into them that do poetry out loud. Um, and and uh, uh, those are great places to work, they, to, 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 to join and to experiment with that stuff. Um, uh, and, and there's, I, I think um, on the Pine Ridge, one of our board members, Dan Sneathan, runs a poetry out loud organization. Um, so it's another place to, to think about joining. But those are the types of places you'd look for, I guess. Yeah, and and you're you're exactly right, Dana. That there are, you know, they're localized, and it, by localized, if we don't know where you lived, then it's hard it's hard to even be imaginative about that. Bruce, you had something you're going to add. Uh, in the Black Hills area, there's a black uh, the Black Hills Writers Group that meets in. Um, uh, Rapid City at the Rapid City Library. I belong, I haven't been down to it. Um, there is uh, three writers groups I belong to uh, when I'm in Spearfish. One is the Balfouche Writers Group uh, and the other is the Bear Lodge uh, uh, Writers Group. And then there's uh, the Spearfish uh, uh, Poetry Gathering. So that's three right there, four right there in the hills. I heard of there's something down in Hot Springs. So that that's about the best I could tell you for the Western part of the state. Another place, um, and I think that they do it kind of online, but they, they sometimes get together. It's the Women's Poetry Collective. It's a group of very, you know, very good, but very caring writers um, that would I think, be welcoming to new writers or to writers who want to experiment with how they sound out loud. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing you can do too is there are there whenever there are uh, I don't know if you call them poetry slams or just poetry readings, you can join those things. And I should say every Thursday night uh, there are some of us who get together and write and and uh, read poetry, and and it's a Zoom meeting, so you can join from you know we have even some people from Saudi Arabia who who who. Uh, <laughs> who uh, show up uh, on these and we share poetry. Now it isn't uh, per se a, a, uh, a podcast, it's a Zoom meeting, but you can, you can read there. And we also talk about some of these poetry issues and, and uh, you know, about writing poetry and we always read our poetry. And so those are, are good um, uh, avenues. Could you share that? Uh, could you share that Zoom meeting with us, Lawrence? Uh, yes, if I if I can get to it quickly, because I'm not one to memorize <laughs> things. Uh, let me see. But but uh, I, I I don't. While I'm searching for this, I don't want to like uh, leave you guys hanging out to dry here. Um, um, I'd like to, go ahead, Bruce. I'd like to mention a couple other things is uh, there's, there's a number of venues, uh, a number of places to send your uh, poetry writing to and, uh, you know, uh, across the state. Uh, well, Past Petals is one, uh, there's a chapbook and then the, uh, the poetry contest. Uh, there's several um, other, uh, most universities have uh, some sort of a literary magazine that accepts uh, submissions. Um, there's uh, one that has been published me a number of times. I'll put a plug in for it. It's uh, Scurf P uh, and Anthology, which their deadline is, uh, well, uh, the end of May here, or the end of May, end of April. So, uh, that, that, yeah, they have a yearly anthology. I've been in every one. I think there's must be their, well, it's their 13th anthology. 
Um, oh, geez. Like I said, most of the universities have like uh, paddlefish uh, down at Yankton. Um, Brookings has theirs, uh, Oak, uh, Oakwood. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm missing some here. Dana. Well, University of South Dakota has the South Dakota Review. Right. But we're actually running out of time, but I didn't want to like skip out on Bobby. I was trying to, the, the, I don't memorize the, uh, this, you know, the, the link. So I was going to put it in the chat, but if you go, uh, to the South Dakota State Poetry Society, uh, website, I think it's on there, isn't it, Dana? I think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's yeah, the yeah. Poetry Garden. Yeah. Poetry it's Garden. A, yeah. Electronic Poetry Garden. And if you so. Google like Electronic Poetry Garden as well. Uh, it will it will show up. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, uh, by the way, that's all the time we have. <laughs> we, we ran out of time uh, quickly, uh, quicker than I would have liked. This is April is poetry month, so uh, invite some friends to read some poetry and you know make some tuna fish sandwich, some potato chips, and Kool Aid, and you got a party. Okay. We'll see you guys uh, next week, same time, same station. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.